This is 1 Samuel 16, starting with verse 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Bear thou home with all, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. All right. So, obviously Samuel loved Saul very much, almost like a son. Um, Samuel's own sons were wicked, and he didn't want Saul to turn out the same way. He wanted Saul to be a righteous king over Israel. But that wasn't the case. So, God sent him out to anoint the man after his own heart. Verse 2. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? Right, because if a prophet shows up to the town, you don't know whether or not they're going to uh, rebuke you for your sins or not. Right? Sometimes it may be for a blessing, sometimes it may be for a curse. And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. Verse 6. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord saith not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And that's one thing that, I, uh, that the scriptures made mention of and I wanted to emphasize last week is how Saul looked the part. All right? He looked like a mighty king. Right, taller than everybody else, um, he he looked like he was a, a strong leader of the people, and Eliab has the same look about him. But uh, the Lord said, I, I, "I'm not doing this based on what they look like. All right, I'm doing this based on who they are on the inside." All right, verse eight. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, "Neither hath the Lord chosen this." Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, Neither had the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Saul, uh, Samuel. Excuse me. Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Here are all thy, are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth sheep. All right. So, all of uh, Jesse's sons. And I do want to uh, double check this, make sure all the audio is all right and everything. All of Jesse's sons come before Samuel. The, the strong leader of the people. And, and Samuel said unto Jesse. Okay. So all praise to the Most High, it is going well. <laughs> I have to double check that now because of the, the one time that it wasn't. Um, anyway, all of Jesse's sons came before Samuel and he said, Here's all my sons right here. And Samuel said, well, these aren't chosen by the Lord. You got another son? And he said, there remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Right? So they're, they're not even thinking on David in, uh, in that sense. They're like, well, he's just a shepherd. He's just, he's just the guy who keeps the sheep. They weren't thinking he needs to be here as well. All right? Verse 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and withal of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. I do want to explain what uh, what ruddy means. All right. Um, and I can do that with an image here, uh, real quick. I want to do this real quick, just so um, I'll go find this image. Let's see. I didn't have it pulled up, um, but it is interesting because the word ruddy means red or reddish brown. That's what the word ruddy means. So let me uh, find this image real here right, right quick because it shows um, a good depiction of what ruddy means. Okay, here we go. I'll zoom in a little bit so we can see it. All right. So as you see here, it says King David is described as ruddy, right? All of these feature a ruddy color, right? This is a ruddy cow. As you can see, it's like a light brown, 
reddish brown, and you have a ruddy duck, and then you have a ruddy horse, and then here are some ruddy children. All right, that's that's what David was. David was um, lighter complected, right? He wasn't like dark dark brown. He was a lighter brown. All right. So I'm gonna exit out of this. Don't save. Let's get back to it. And he says, now he was ruddy and with all of beautiful countenance. So he was a pretty boy, all right? He was light-skinned, pretty boy, goodly to look to. That's why God said, look, he doesn't look like a mighty king, but he is uh, a mighty warrior is what he ended up being, and he ended up being a righteous king, all right? And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he, all right? So when you see ruddy in the scriptures, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about that uh, lighter complexion. It ain't talking about white or red neck type red. It's talking about lighter complexion. All right. Brown, but a light brown. Ruddy brown. Reddish brown. All right. Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Another example would be uh, like how they call Malcolm X red. Right. That was his. If you've ever seen the Malcolm X movie, you know that was like a childhood nickname. Or if you know anything about Malcolm X, they called him red. And he was like a light-skinned ruddy. But anyway, God said, arise and anoint David. Right? Verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And you know how I usually do. I like to uh, pull the, well, let me go back, pull the maps. And just to refresh people on all the different cities and stuff. Um, Ramah is right here in Benjamin. That is where Samuel's from. All right. That's where he lived, I should say. All right. So let's get uh, Bethlehem. Because we mentioned Bethlehem. Bethlehem's a, a prominent city, so I just assume people know where it's at, but it's south of Jerusalem. All right. Pretty close to Jerusalem. You could even say next town over type situation. But, uh,. Yeah, it's south of Jerusalem. So let's get back. Right, so Samuel just anointed David, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Right, he got the Holy Spirit from that anointing. Verse 14, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. You see that right there? So... A lot of people think that um, God has no control over evil and God doesn't do evil. That's not true. As you can see here, the spirit of the Lord is from God, obviously, and an evil spirit also comes from God. God controls everything. God controls righteous spirits and evil spirits. He sends them on whom he will. All right. Verse 15. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Right? Uh, soothing music. Right? Soothing music to calm you down. Verse 17. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, that is a that is cunning in playing and a mighty valiant man and a man of war and prudent in manners and a comely person and the lord is with him wherefore saul sent messengers unto jesse and said send me david thy son which is with the sheep right so this is this is by the time uh david has a reputation about him they knew him as a musician as well and jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by david his son unto saul and David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer, right? David became an uh, armor bearer back in those days when it talked about the men of the Lord having armor bearers. It's more like a PA today, right? Like a personal assistant. That's what the armor bearer did. Obviously, they did carry their armor, but they would just serve them in, in all things, essentially. Um, so, yeah, David loved Saul, and, and we'll see that as we, as we go along. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand. 
So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Right? Uh, David was also very musically talented, amongst everything else that we read. Right? You know, light skinned, pretty boy, musically talented. And what people would not expect him to be a mighty warrior and a righteous king, but that's what he ended up being. All right. Uh, chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah and uh, Ephes Damim. All right. I doubt any of that's going to be on the map, but we can still check it out. Um, what do we got over here? Again, because I, I have to reiterate every have to reiterate this every time that we mention the Philistines and the Judites in battle. And that is this right here, this valley, was disputed territory. And it was always fought between primarily the Philistines and Judah, but uh, it even goes on up into Dan and Ephraim, you could say. Um so I would assume it's somewhere in there. I don't see it anywhere on this map. Uh, you see Timnah, I'm kind of covering it right there. Beth Shemesh to the east of that. Um, Marasha, Lakish, Eglon, Ziklag. Let's see, what did it say? It said Azekah and Shoko. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see none of that on there. Regardless, it's most likely right here in this valley. Um, there's Ashan down there. Okay. Let's get back at it. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Right? So, um... I believe a span is uh, nine inches. I may be I may be wrong about that, but uh, a cubit was eighteen inches in in, in modern lengths. So um, let, let's see what a span is real quick. I think it's half of a cubit. A span. No, that's not it. It's by a human hand. Okay, okay. So it's, yeah, so this is, this that Google is trying to show us is of streets and of bridges. But, as it says right here, in ancient times, a span, the unit of a span, as you can see here, it's across the hand. Uh, half a cubit. Uh, as it says right here in the second sentence in ancient times which is what we're looking at ancient times a span was considered to be half a cubit so half a cubit uh, is nine inches all right so six cubits if you do the math on that 18 inches or uh, a foot and a half right that would end up being nine foot and nine inches tall that's how big Goliath was all right and when you consider who the Philistines are, and the Philistines are the modern-day Sudanese, right, pushed on into Africa by all the people that came through, primarily the, uh, the Arabs, the Persians, and the uh, Greeks, even the Romans, you could say. Um, so those Sudanese people, you know, like you got like Manut Bol and Bol Bol, they're easily over seven foot tall, right? So it's not that hard to imagine that in ancient times, you had a man who was nine foot nine and a mighty warrior. All right, even the uh, the tallest man in the 20th century in the 1900s that was recorded was a, a man from Illinois, and it, it wasn't a, a Sudanese man, but it was a white guy. Uh, I believe his name was a uh, Winlow, something something Winlow, and he was he was almost nine foot. All right, that's the tallest recorded person in the 20th century. Uh, so you can only imagine back in ancient times Somebody nine foot nine is not that hard to imagine um, Verse 5 and he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat Was 5,000 shekels of brass, right? So heavy armor heavy-duty armor 
and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him right so a weaver's beam uh, we can look that up real quick a weaver's beam uh, and let's go images because you have people who's recreated the spear um, like how big this spear would be I can't necessarily say that that's accurate but you know you have people who, who have done their, their due diligence right and the weaver's beam is up in here right so so very big very big uh, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Right? So Goliath is calling them out. Say, let's do this one-on-one. -on -one. Send down your best warrior. I'm the best warrior for my people. Right? Because we, we look at that height, and it's not even like the, the tallest guy recorded in the scriptures. Not necessarily. But he, he was the mightiest warrior of the Philistines at that time. Right? Not even necessarily the tallest. But the best warrior. So he's saying, send me your best warrior. We'll do it out one on one, and that'll decide the uh, decide the war. All right. Verse twelve. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah. Ephrathite uh, is short for Ephrata. Bethlehem Ephrata was an ancient name for Bethlehem, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. The man went. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul, right? So Jesse was older. He was an older man. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the name of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the next unto him, Abinadab, and the third, Shema. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. All right, so 40 days. He comes out here and makes this challenge every day. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn, these ten loaves, and, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp of thy brethren. All right, take them some food, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Right, so you know, um, check in on your brothers, see how they're doing. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. All right, so I'm I'm just going to assume that the valley of Elah is somewhere. It's either this whole area that I've described, or it's um, one specific area amongst this area, right, between Judah and uh, the Gaza coast. All right. Um, where was I at? I just read verse 19. Verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. Right, so this is 40 days where Goliath makes this pledge or makes this uh, challenge, I should say. And each day, the Israelites would rather, um, excuse me, let me, let me plug on my computer real quick. And each day, the Israelites would rather go to war with all the Philistines as opposed to challenging Goliath one-on-one. -on -one. All right? Um, shout, uh, Going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. Verse 21. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. Right? So he, he uh, as soon as he seen the war was going on, he said, y'all stay here. And he, he just run out there like, shalom, y'all, what's going on? 
Uh, verse 23, and as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard him. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches. And will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Right? So like free of taxes. Verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Right? So he, he's watching what Goliath is doing. And he's like, who is this guy? He ain't nobody. Verse 27. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Right? So uh, the, the previous little uh, stanza, right? Um, the king will make him rich, give him his daughter to marry, and, uh, you know, free his father's house from taxes. Verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, right? The older brother and, and the jealousy of the younger. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. He said, You're just trying to sneak a peek at the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered, again, answered him again after the former manner. Right? So he said, Uh... So David's response to that, he said, surely there's a reason God brought me down here. And I'm seeing what this what this uncircumcised Philistine is saying, and I'm not going to let this uh, transpire. Verse 31. And when the words were heard which David spake, he rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. All right, so David's still a young man right here. And Saul said, You ain't even been trained. And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he had defied the armies of the living God. Right? So David said, look, keeping them sheep is not as easy as you think. I had to fight off these wild animals, a lion and a bear, to, to keep my sheep safe. And that's the type of man that David was. A lesser man would have said, man, forget that sheep. I ain't about to fight no lion or no bear for a sheep. Right? But David said, no, it's my job to keep these sheep safe. That's what I'm going to do. All right. Uh, that was the faith that David had. All right. He, and it's the same faith that where he can see this mighty warrior, this man who's, you know, probably not twice his height, but damn near. Right. He sees this man and he's like, who is this man to stand against the armies of the living God? Nobody. It doesn't matter how big he is, how strong he is, how mighty he is. He can't fight against God. Verse 37. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. Saul said, hey, you ain't even one of my warriors. I'll send you out there. Uh, and Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass on his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it, right? So it, none of it fitted, none of the armor fitted. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, when, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine, right? So this is the, the famous part that everybody knows, right? He took... Uh, five stones, right, and got his sling and walked over to Goliath. Verse 41, And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. 
And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, right? He hated him. Uh, and <laughs> he was, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He, he berated him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. He's like, look at this light-skinned pretty boy coming out here. And the, the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, right? So it'd be like, Dagon curse you and all this kind of stuff. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh into the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field, right? So he said, you about to be um, something, something that they used to say, I don't know what they say now, but minced meat, right? You're going to be uh, food, you're going to be worm food, right? You're going to be, uh, you know, buzzard food, vulture food. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, which thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Right? So he said, look, all that that you just cursed, me with that's going to be coming back on your own head because you have cursed the God of Israel and his armies and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands right like it says in Exodus 15 and 3 the Lord is a man of war right the battle is always God's and he decides who's going to win it all right verse 48 and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Right? He didn't even need the other four stones. He just needed that first one. That first rock went right in his head. Right. One uh, headshot. Right. Boom. Verse 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David, right? All that stuff that Saul gave him was too big for him. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled, right? So the mightiest warrior that they had, this, you know, young Light-skinned pretty boy just cut his head off with his own sword. So, so they're scared. They, they seen where they messed up, right? Verse 52. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. All right. And Ekron is right here. Right up here. That is Ekron. Uh, specifically that one. I know I circled Timnah as well, but... That's that ground right there. So, yeah, they must have been somewhere around here if they pursued them all the way up here. Something like that. But anyway, they, they drove them back to Philistine territory. As we see here at the beginning of the chapter, the Philistines come and try to take... Um, cities that belonged to Judah, right? But they pursued them back. After David killed Goliath, they pursued them back to Philistine territory. So we're, oh, to Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to uh, Sharaim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron, right? Um, so we see Gath is right here in the middle of the valley, essentially. All right. So let's get back to it. And verse 53. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents, right? Took the goods from their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent, right? So um, he, he took the armor, but he, um, he took the head to Jerusalem. Verse 55. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. Abner said, I don't know who this is. 
And the king said, Inquire thou whose son the stripling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Right? So, that, uh, that freed Jesse and his house of taxes, right? And it builds on the reputation of David, right? Showing that, that he's very capable in war. He's a mighty warrior as well. So, let's start with the next chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 18, start with verse 1. And it came to pass when he had, let me bring this up some. It came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the, son, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Right, as his best friend. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow, bow and to his girdle, right? Because he was his best friend. He wanted to show loyalty. He said, look, I'll, I'll give you the clothes off my back, right? Verse 5. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, of that Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music, right? So when the king, in ancient times, when the king comes back into town, everybody comes out and they start singing and dancing and throwing a party, right? Having a parade, essentially. Verse 7. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands, right? So now David is a man of war and a mighty man of war and people are starting to make songs about him. And Saul was very wroth and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward, right? That evil spirit from the Lord is starting to corrupt Saul, right? He's got that envy. And he, you, you can't compare yourself to other people, right? You know what you have going on, and you know what you can do. And it's one thing if Saul would have said, David slaying his ten thousands, I can, I can slay more. I can do more. I can do more as far as leading the people. I can do more. Or he could have been like, I'm happy for David. Look at all this glory that he's getting. He's a mighty warrior. I'm glad he's on my side. You know what I mean? But instead, he's looking at him like, why is David getting this? I should be getting that. You know what I mean? There's, there's ways to appreciate the good and the honor that someone else is getting. You don't have to be uh, jealous and envious and evil about it. But of course Saul was. He had that evil spirit on him. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand, as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Right. So this is two times that Saul had threw a spear at David, a javelin at David, and David had to duck it or he had to, you know, juke it, sidestep, had to get out of there before Saul killed him. Verse 12. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Right? Because Saul had the spirit of the Lord at one point. He was the Lord's anointed, the first king over Israel, right? So he knows what it's like when somebody's moving in the spirit. And now he sees that he's not moving in the spirit no more, but he sees that David is. All right, and he can see, oh, this is my replacement. This is who the Lord is going to give the kingdom to. All right. Therefore, 
Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people, right? So here he gave David rank to be a military man. And he said, okay, you're, an arm, you're a military man. You're a mighty warrior. Go out and fight for the people. Verse 14. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways. And the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him, right? So Saul is saying, David is doing everything that I didn't do. David is better than me in, in most everything, all right? Verse 16, but all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them, right? So uh, again, I, I've mentioned this a lot where the king in ancient times especially in the first days of their reign, they would lead the people into battle and they would uh, secure the victory for them, right? They would be the, the first one on the horse or on the uh, chariot or whatever, leading the people into battle. But when the, when the king would get complacent, even in ancient times, or when they would get older, they would sit back and put someone else in charge of it. Saul put David in charge of it. So now the parades that the people are throwing whenever the people come back from war... It's all for David, right? So the people are, are, are loving David more and more. All right. Verse 17. And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter Merab, her will I give thee to wife. But only be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not my hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. Right? So, um, just as I had mentioned earlier, just as the scripture had mentioned earlier, Saul is sending David out to fight all these battles. Because Saul wants David to be killed by the Philistines, right? But the Lord is with David and allowing him and, you know, uh, pushing him to move wisely so that he wins these battles. So this is, this is just, and, and of course, he's coming back to the people, victorious. They're throwing the parades and the parties for him. This is all working against Saul, even though Saul meant it for David's detriment. It's all working uh, hand in hand. All right. And David said to Saul, who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it came to pass at that, at the time when Merab Saul's daughter should have been given to David, that she was given unto Adriel, the, uh, Maholathite to wife, right? So he was from Mahola. Um, but anyway, uh, as we read, and the last chapter, David got to marry the daughter of the king because he defeated Goliath, right? But uh, Saul double-crossed him, right? Give his daughter away to um, this guy, Adriel. Verse 20. And Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give him her that she may be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one of the twain. Right, so he said, either way, I'll, I'll give you uh, another one of my daughters. Verse 22. And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king had delight in thee, and all his servants loved thee. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spake those words in the ears of David. And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law? seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed. Right, so um, they're communicating via messengers, right? And David said, well, what do I have to do to be the king's son-in-law? Because this isn't just, you know, I I anybody else would look at this uh, honor and this privilege and be like, yeah, I'm right on it. But David was the type of man that said, no, I got to earn this. What, what is something that I can, I can do to earn this uh, privilege? Um, verse 25 and Saul said thus shall ye say to David the king desireth not any dowry but a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies but Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines right so he said a hundred foreskins from the Philistines there's no way he's going to get that close to the Philistines there's no way he's going to be able to do that verse 26 and when his servants told David these words it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law and the days were not expired, right? So he didn't, uh, like say, you had to be married by such and such date. He didn't wait, he went and did it. 
Verse 27. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines 200 men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full tale to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, to wife. Right? So, <laughs> Saul said 100 foreskins. David said, I'll do you even better. I'll bring you 200 of these dead Philistines. All right? Verse 28. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David. And Saul became David's enemy continually. Right? Because now David was just a commoner. He was just a common man. Now he actually has a direct line to the throne. Right? Now this isn't exactly how it happens. But um, even in the eyes of the people. They see that David is very connected to the throne now, right? So again, it's all working against Saul because he's, he's meaning these things uh, for evil, but God is meaning these things for good, all right? He's, he's trying to set up David so that he um, dies or uh, gets killed, whatever the situation may be. But of course, the Lord is turning it around for David because David has faith in the Lord and David uh, moves wisely. All right. As it says right here, Saul became David's enemy continually. Uh, verse 30. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much said by. Right. So David is the of all the uh, of all the warriors in Israel at this time. David was the most renowned. All right. Let's go to chapter 19 and verse 1. And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. Right? So Saul ain't trying to beat around the bush no more. He said, we got to kill him now. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father seeketh to kill thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning and abide in a secret place and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand by uh, stand beside my father in the field where thou art and I will commune with my father of thee and what I see that I will tell thee uh, verse 4 and Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father and said unto him let not the king sin against his servant against David because he hath not sinned against thee and because his works have been to thee word very good so Jonathan is trying to be the uh, voice of reason here in, in, in Saul's ear, in his, in his dad's ear, saying, why, why are you trying to kill David? David has only ever done good to you. He's never done anything evil to you. Why would you want to kill him? Verse 5, for he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine, and the Lord brought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it and did rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? Verse 6, and Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swear, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. Right? So he, he recalled that um, that order that he put that he gave to his servants to kill David. Um, verse 7. And Jonathan called David and showed him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. Right? Because David didn't want to go nowhere near Saul since he tried to kill him. Alright. Verse 8. And there was a war, and there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter. And they fled from him. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand. Right? So that, that just gives you the, uh, the mental image, right? Of Saul sitting here on the throne and he has his javelin in his hand, right? Wanting to do evil with it. And David's just over here playing his music because he loves Saul, right? And he, uh, was a righteous man. Uh, verse 10. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin. Right? Throw the javelin so hard that it pierces through David and into the wall. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. Right? So he, he left again. Verse 11. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. 
And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. Right? So this is, you know, we, we started with, with David in his youth. He was probably around, you know, in his teen, teenage years. Now he's a mighty warrior. He's got his own house, got his own family, all that kind of stuff. And McCall's saying, you better get out of here because they're trying to kill you. So McCall let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And McCall took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. All right, you ever seen that in the movies where, where the kid sneaks out, but he leaves the, the dummy in the bed? This is where they get that from. All right? But the, the mental image, or, or, or rather the image that comes to my mind whenever I uh, read this, and really all throughout the Kings, is the Game of Thrones type stuff going on, right? As you can see, the... the um, Saul's losing the grip of his sanity, trying to uh, maintain his kingdom, right? Now he's doing evil things, while David's just being a righteous man, and we're going to see the kingdom uh, given to him from the Lord, all right? Verse 14, anyway, uh, David snuck out, got the little dummy in the bed, and when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. And Saul sent the mess messengers again to see David, saying, bring him up to me in the bed, that I may slay him, right? So basically telling his daughter, hey, bring him out so I can kill him. <laughs> bring your husband out so that I can kill him. Verse 16. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said to uh, Michal, why hast thou deceived me so and sent away mine enemy that he has escaped? And Michal answered Saul, he said unto me, let me go. Why should I kill thee? Yeah, right. So, McCall said, "Look, why why am I gonna bring, why am I gonna let you kill my husband?" Right? He said, "Let me go." I let him go. Verse eighteen. So David fled and escaped, and came to Samuel to Ramah, and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Najoth. I don't know where Najoth is and if it's gonna be on here, uh, but we see Ramah. Um, I don't see Najat. It's probably, if I had to guess, I would assume it's in Judah somewhere, just because that's pretty close to Ramah. Um, I'm not seeing Najat anywhere. I suppose it could be somewhere else, but uh, I'm not seeing it anywhere. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not seeing it anywhere. I'm assuming it's in Judah, but I could be wrong on that. They went to Najath. Um, oh, okay. N Najath is in Ramah, so it's it's a suburb of the city. Went dwelt to Najath. And it was told Saul, saying, be, this is verse 19, Behold, David is at Najath in Ramah. All right. Or Nayath. So it's a suburb of Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul. And they also prophesied, right? So <laughs> instead of them moving in that same evil spirit that Saul had sent them in to capture this innocent man, once they got there, they started prophesying. They said, man, we, don't, we shouldn't take you. You're sent by the Lord. We're sitting here prophesying, right? Speaking the word of God. Uh, verse 21. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. So the same thing happened to the next group of men that he sent to come and take David. So Samuel, the man of God, he said, I have a plan of action. We're going to go where they know where you're at, and we're going to go, and we're going to just prophesy the scriptures. Right? We're going to uh, be in the word of God. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Right? So amongst Samuel, they can't kill David because everyone's in the spirit. Everyone's in the spirit of the Lord. They're all prophesying. Then went, he, then went he also to Ramah and came to a great well that is in uh, Seku, Setu. And he asked and said, where are Samuel and David? And the one said, behold, they be at Nayoth and Ramah. And he went thither to Nayoth and Ramah, and the spirit of God was upon him also. So this is Saul. He came down and as soon as he entered the company of Samuel, David, and the rest of the prophets, 
that evil spirit fled from him and he started prophesying too and he went on and prophesied until he came to Nayoth in Ramah and he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night wherefore they say is Saul also among the prophets and we read that last week uh, in, in 1 Samuel 10 and that became a proverb right um, back then when, when Saul was a young man just got anointed to be king over Israel uh, they started saying a Saul among the prophets right because it was surprising that this man Saul was prophesying with the prophets and here they use that proverb likewise it said a Saul also among the prophets right so it, it's that that's a double-edged sword right it, it can be it's Saul also among the prophets is a saying that can be used to refer to people you didn't think would be prophesying or prophesying but also it was uh it was against Saul and, and, and that well I suppose either way it's, it, it means whether it be for good or for evil I guess um, people who you didn't expect to be prophesying or prophesying right because Saul came down here to achieve this purpose of, of murdering David but once he got there he felt convicted in his soul right and he started prophesying as well Hope I explained that clearly because I don't know, it seemed like it didn't come out right, but uh, anyway, first Samuel twenty and start with verse one. This might be the last chapter that we read. We may go forward a little bit, but um this is this is sort of sort of pivotal. Because it changes Jonathan's perspective on the whole situation. Um, but first Samuel 20, starting with verse 1. And David fled from Nayoth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is mine iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? And he said unto him, God forbid, thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. Right? So, um, Jonathan from the... Uh, I believe it was in the previous chapter where he uh, kept his father in the spirit and said, you shouldn't be killing David. He ain't done nothing to you, right? And also, when Saul went down to try to kill David, he started prophesying, right? So Jonathan is saying this like, look, sometimes my father gets out the spirit, but he ain't going to kill you. Everything's going to be all right. All right. Uh, Any time that he goes over something like this, I'll just put, uh, keep him in the spirit, essentially. Verse 3, And David swore moreover and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, let, Jonathan, let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. All right, so David said, look, um, look, your father's getting smart to the situation. He knows that we're best friends, and he's going to try to hide this from you and, and, and try to kill me. Verse 4, Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat, but let me go, that I may hide myself in the field unto the third day at even. If thy father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he say, Thus it is well, thy servant shall have peace, but if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Right? So David said, Look, I got a plan. Normally on the new moons, on the feast days, I would come and celebrate it with y'all. And especially since I'm the son-in-law of the king, that's what I'm supposed to do. But let's let's uh, do this test. Let's test your father to see if he's really trying to kill me. Let's test the king. All right. I'm going to go hide somewhere. And if he said that it, it's fine that he asked to leave, it's fine that he's not here, um then we're, we're good. He's not trying to kill me. But if he's mad that I'm not there, that means he was trying to kill me. All right. So, verse 8. Therefore, thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. Notwithstanding, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself. 
for why shouldst thou bring me to thy father? Right? So David's like, look, you've been, you've been nice to me, but if I've done anything evil, you can kill me for it. Right? You're right here. Kill me right now. And Jonathan said, far be it, far be it from thee. For if I knew certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon thee, then would not I tell it thee? He's like, look, I don't, I don't hide nothing from you. Right? We're best friends. I would tell you if my father is plotting something against you. And he's like, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't say. Verse 10. Then said David to Jonathan, who shall tell me? Or what if thy father answer thee roughly? Verse 11. And Jonathan said to David, come, let us go out into the field. And they went out both of them into the field. Verse 12. And Jonathan said to David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow, any time or the third day, and behold, if there be good toward David, and I then send not unto thee and show it thee. Man, I pressed the wrong thing. Pardon me. Verse 13. The Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do thee evil, then I will show it thee and send thee away, that thou mayest go in peace. And the Lord will be with thee as he hath been with my father. Right? So they made a covenant right here. Uh, Jonathan swore unto God that he was going to tell David um, the situation, whether it be Saul doing something evil towards David, trying to murder him, or whether it be uh, that David is, is, you know, being paranoid. All right. Either way, Jonathan's going to go to the new moon, talk to Saul, see what is uh, what's going on. What's the situation? All right. Where, okay, verse 14. And thou shalt not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. All right, so not only me, but my kids forever. No, not when the Lord had cut off the enemies of David, everyone from the face of the earth. Excuse me. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan calls David to swear again because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul, right? And that's that kind of love that, um, that best friends have, right? They love them even as their self. Verse 18. Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and thou shalt be missed, because thy seat will be empty. And when thou hast stayed three days, then thou shalt go down quickly and come to the place where thou didst hide thyself when the business was in hand and shalt remain by the stone Ezel. And I will shoot three arrows on the side thereof as though I shot at a mark. And behold, I will send a lad saying, go, find out the arrows. If I expressly say unto the lad, behold, the arrows are on this side of thee, take them. Then come thou, for there is peace to thee and no hurt as the Lord liveth. But if I say thus unto the young man, Behold, the arrows are beyond thee, go thy way, for the Lord has sent thee away. And as touching the matter which thou and I have spoken of, behold, the Lord be between thee and me forever. Right? So they made they made a, a bond there, a special bond that day, a special covenant between the Lord and the two of them, as far as blessing each other's families, blessing each other's houses. Um, and they, they made a little um, signal. To, to show the situation, right? Um, whether it be good or evil for David. Verse 24. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat him down to eat meat. And the king sat upon his seat as at other times, even upon a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side, and David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul spake not anything that day, for he thought something had befallen him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. Right? So he knows David. David never miss a feast day. Right? So surely he's, uh, you know, he's just unclean or something. And it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. Right? So back then, we'd keep the opening and the closing of the new moon. Right? Uh, these days, we're lucky, lucky if we get to keep it, you know, one of those days. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet, neither yesterday nor today? And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. 
And he said, Let me go, I pray thee, for our family hath a sacrifice in the city, and my brother, he hath commanded me to be there. And now, if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away, I pray thee, and see my brother. Therefore he cometh not into the king's table. All right, so Jonathan told him, told him the story. Verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion, and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? For long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. Right? So Saul, as I mentioned earlier, he knows that the Lord has chosen David to take his place. And he's saying, what are you doing, you stupid, you stupid son of mine? You will never be king as long as David's around. Bring him forth so I can kill him. Uh, verse 32. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? Right? So he's just asking him a simple question. What is... What is your problem with David? He's done no evil. Why are you trying to kill him? Verse 33. And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. Yeah, that's pretty obvious at that point. You are uh, trying to kill your son because he told David he could go see his family. Then, uh, yeah, it's pretty obvious he wants to kill David. Verse 34, So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did eat no meat the second day of the month. For he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. Right? So now Jonathan is mourning on two fronts. Right? He's mourning that his father is an evil and wicked man. And he's mourning that, you know, there's somebody out to kill his best friend. Right? It just so happened to be one and the same. It's very, uh, it can be very... Uh, mentally taxing, emotionally taxing, I should say. Um, verse 35. And it came to pass in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David and a little lad with him, right? So his little assistant. And he said unto his lad, Run, find out the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the lad was coming to the, come to the place of the arrow which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond thee? Right, that's the that's the uh, code word, right, for Saul is trying to kill you. And Jonathan cried after the lad, Make speed, haste, stay not. And Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came to his master. But the lad knew not anything. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter, right? So, um, to the lad right to the servant of Jonathan he just you know thinks oh the, the arrows are a little further I should go get them right but but David knows because they they had that secret code established verse 40 and Jonathan gave his artillery unto his lad and said unto him go carry them to the city and as soon as the lad was gone David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times and they kissed one another and wept one with another until David exceeded right so they, they, they're they sitting there mourning for a while because this is the last time they'll see each other. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure this is the last time they see each other because David's got to flee out of the kingdom un until Saul is dead. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed. And Jonathan went into the city. Right. So um, this is where we're going to close out this week with David fleeing from Saul because Saul is trying to kill him. All right? And we will um we might even have to make a part 3 to this. It depends on how how long it takes to do the next um few chapters. But with that, I hope y'all learned something. Um this this whole situation is about envy, right? It's about um envy and hatred from that because Saul sees that the Lord is dealing with David and he's not dealing with him anymore. All right. But if you remember last week, what it all stems from, if Saul would have done everything God had commanded, the Lord would still be dealing with him. So that, that would be a way that he could have remedied the situation here and just stayed in the spirit of the Lord. But instead, letting that evil spirit take over, letting those evil thoughts take over, and uh, it's going to cost him. 